My boyfriend's anger over missed calls created a rift between us. Now, after facing our issues together, we're stronger and more connected than ever. Living with Alex has been like sharing my space with a permanent fixture of excitement and unpredictability. It's a roller coaster that neither of us ever really asked for, but ended up riding anyway. We're both young, figuring out life in our own corners of the world. And somehow, our corners collided and stuck together. I'm 24, knee-deep in design projects that never seem to end, and Alex, a year older, is always tangled up in the latest software development at his startup. Our lives are hectic, to say the least, but we've managed to find our little bubble of calm within the storm, or so I thought. On the fateful Saturday that threw everything off balance, I had planned to spend the day at Sarah's place. She's my go-to person when the world seems too much, a fellow art enthusiast, and a reminder that life isn't just deadlines and briefs. Alex was supposed to hang out with Mike, his childhood friend who's the epitome of a free spirit, always dragging Alex into one adventure or another. Given our plans, I thought it'd be a day like any other, where we'd both do our thing and reconvene at home, filled with stories to share. That morning over coffee, I remember telling Alex I'd be at Sarah's. He nodded, absorbed in his phone, a nonverbal cue I took as understanding. As the day unfolded in Sarah's cozy living room, filled with art supplies and half-finished canvases, I felt a wave of relaxation I hadn't experienced in a long time. We talked, painted and shared a simple lunch, our phones forgotten in another room as we immersed ourselves in creativity and laughter. I had texted Alex before diving into the day, asking about his plans for the evening, wondering if he and Mike would want to join Sarah and me for dinner. When I didn't hear back, I shrugged it off, assuming he was caught up in the moment just as I was. It was a decision I'd come to regret. After what felt like mere minutes but was actually hours, the need to check my phone nagged at me, pulling me away from the canvas in front of me. Finding my phone was the easy part facing the storm. It unlocked was not. Eleven missed calls, numerous texts, each more frantic than the last, from Alex demanding to know where I was, why I wasn't answering. Panic nodded in my stomach as I called him back, only for it to go straight to voicemail. The drive home was a blur, my mind racing through every worst-case scenario. Arriving back to our shared apartment felt like stepping into a parallel universe where everything was the same yet irrevocably different. Alex's anger was a tangible force, cold and unyielding. My explanations, my apologies, seemed to dissipate before they could even reach him. He accused me of never listening, of always keeping my phone on silent as if it were a crime I was perpetually guilty of. His words stung, not because they were entirely untrue, but because they highlighted how little we understood each other's needs in moments of separation. The silence in our apartment, a stark contrast to the laughter and warmth that had filled Sarah's place just hours before. I could feel Alex's anger in every deliberate movement he made, a silent storm brewing. It was as if the air itself was thick with unspoken words, making it hard to breathe, hard to think. I approached him tentatively, my heart pounding in my chest. Alex, I'm so sorry, I began, my voice barely above a whisper. I didn't realize my phone was on silent. I never meant to worry you. He didn't turn to face me. His posture remained rigid, the muscles in his back tensing further at my words. The silence stretched between us, a gaping chasm that seemed to grow wider with each passing second. I waited for him to say something, anything, but he remained silent, a statue of contained fury. Feeling my resolve waver, I tried again, desperation seeping into my tone. Please, can we talk about this? I know I messed up, but I want to make it right. Finally, he turned his expression a mask of frustration and hurt. You never listen, he snapped, his words like daggers. Your phone is always on silent. You're always in your own world, oblivious to everything else. I flinched at the harshness in his voice, the accusation stinging more than I cared to admit. It was true that I often kept my phone on silent, a habit born from my desire to find moments of peace in our constantly connected world. But I had never considered how this might affect Alex, how my actions, however unintentional, could be interpreted as negligence. I didn't think it was a big deal, I stammered, struggling to defend my actions without dismissing his feelings. I just wanted a day without distractions. I didn't mean to ignore you. But you did, he countered, his voice rising in anger. You ignored me, ignored my calls, my messages. How do you think that made me feel, 
like I'm not important enough to warrant even a moment of your attention. His words cut deep, revealing the depth of his hurt and insecurity. It dawned on me then that this wasn't just about a missed call or a silent phone. It was about feeling valued, feeling heard, something we had both seemingly taken for granted in our relationship. I opened my mouth to respond, to try and explain how much he meant to me. But he continued, unleashing months of pent-up frustration. It's always the same with you. You're there, but not really. You listen, but you don't hear. I'm tired of feeling like I'm talking to a wall. His harsh assessment of our communication, or lack thereof, was a bitter pill to swallow. I had always prided myself on being a good listener, but here was Alex, the person I loved, telling me I was failing him in the most basic aspect of our relationship. The room seemed to close in on me as he spoke. Each word a weight added to the burden of guilt and realization I now carried. I had been so wrapped up in my own world, my own needs, that I had failed to see how my actions affected the person closest to me. I'm sorry, I whispered, the words feeling inadequate in the face of his anger. I didn't realize how much this was affecting you. Please, let's figure this out together. But he was done talking. Turning away, he left the room, leaving me alone with the weight of our unresolved issues. The silence that followed was a different kind, one filled with regret and the painful understanding that apologies were not. As the silence stretched on, becoming a constant presence in our home, I knew that something had to give. The days following our confrontation felt like moving through a thick fog, each step uncertain and heavy with the weight of our unresolved issues. The silence between us was a constant presence, an uninvited guest that neither of us seemed capable of dismissing. It was during these days of silence that I realized the gravity of the situation and the urgent need for a resolution. Determined to bridge the gap that had formed between us, I decided to write Alex a letter. It seemed archaic, perhaps, in an age dominated by instant messaging and emails, but it felt right. A letter would allow me to articulate my thoughts without the risk of being interrupted or misunderstood. It would be a tangible expression of my sincerity, something he could hold in his hands and read in his own time. I spent hours drafting and redrafting the letter, each word carefully chosen, each sentence a step towards reconciliation. I poured out my heart on those pages, expressing my regret over the incident and the pain of the days that followed. I acknowledged my part in our communication breakdown and expressed my desire to work through our issues together. I left the letter on his pillow, a silent plea for understanding and forgiveness. Days passed without any sign that he had read the letter, the tension in our apartment growing with each silent meal and avoided glance. It was during this time of uncertainty that I sought advice from those closest to me. I spoke first to Sarah, my confidant and partner in art. Over cups of coffee in her cluttered kitchen, I shared the details of our argument and my fears for the future of my relationship. Sarah listened with the patience of a saint, her eyes filled with sympathy and concern. She offered no easy solutions but reminded me of the importance of patience and open communication. Relationships are like canvases, she said. Sometimes they require a bit of reworking to get right. Encouraged by Sarah's metaphor, I next sought the perspective of my older brother David. Known for his pragmatic approach to life, David had always been my sounding board for practical matters. His advice was characteristically straightforward. Talk to him, he urged, not through letters or texts but face to face. Show him you're willing to listen and change. Buoyed by their words, I resolved to make one more attempt at initiating conversation with Alex. That day I decided to talk to Alex first, he went to work late again and it seemed like he didn't want to talk to me. I curled up on the couch, lost in a book, when the phone rang. The sharp trill shattered the quiet, making my heart leap into my throat. It was Alex's number, but the voice on the other end wasn't his. It was Mike, his voice edged with panic, informing me that Alex had been in a minor bike accident on his way home. Fear, sharp and all-consuming, propelled me into action. I barely remember grabbing my keys and rushing out the door, my mind racing with worst-case scenarios. The hospital was a blur of white walls and hushed voices, and then I saw him, bruised but alive, his arm in a sling. Relief flooded through me, mingling with the remnants of fear to create a cocktail of emotions I couldn't begin to untangle. It was in that sterile hospital room, surrounded by the beeping of machines, that the walls between us finally came down. The tension that had been our constant companion dissolved in the face of a stark reminder of how fragile life could be. Alex's eyes met mine, 
and I saw the vulnerability there, the unspoken fear that mirrored my own. Words were unnecessary. Our shared relief was palpable, a bridge over the chasm that had divided us. Later, when we were finally alone, the heart-to-heart -heart that had been weeks in the making unfolded with an ease that surprised us both. The conversation started hesitantly, each of us testing the waters, but the floodgates soon opened, releasing a torrent of pent-up emotions and unvoiced fears. Alex spoke first, his voice low and tinged with pain, not from his injuries but from the emotional toll. He admitted how the accident had made him realize the fragility of everything we took for granted, including our relationship. The thought of losing what we had over something as trivial as missed calls and misunderstandings seemed absurdly foolish now. I listened, really listened, letting his words wash over me, feeling the weight of them in my heart. When it was my turn, I spoke from a place of raw honesty, sharing my own realizations about the importance of communication and the dangers of complacency. I confessed how the fear of seeing him hurt had brought into sharp focus the depth of my feelings for him, how the idea of losing him was unbearable. We talked about the need for balance, for finding a middle ground where we could both feel heard and valued. We discussed practical steps to improve our communication, like setting aside dedicated time each day to connect without distractions and agreeing to voice our concerns and frustrations before they escalated into resentment. It was a conversation marked by tears and laughter, by apologies and forgiveness. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt truly connected to Alex, not just as my partner but as my best friend, my confidant. We laid bare our fears and desires, not just for our relationship, but for our individual selves within it. As we left the hospital, Alex's arm draped over my shoulders for support, I felt a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for his safety, for the strength of our bond, and for the unexpected incident that had jolted us out of complacency and into a deeper understanding of each other. In the days that followed our night at the hospital, the atmosphere in our apartment underwent a palpable shift. The cloud of tension that had loomed over us dissipated, replaced by a renewed sense of understanding and connection. It was as if the accident had jolted us back to reality, reminding us of the fragility of life and the importance of cherishing every moment we had together. Our journey towards understanding and forgiveness wasn't instantaneous. It required effort, patience, and a willingness to truly listen to each other. We started by setting aside time each evening to talk not just about our day but about how we were feeling, what was troubling us, and how we could support each other better. These conversations were sometimes difficult, opening up old wounds and exposing vulnerabilities we had both tried to hide, but they were also healing, providing us with the opportunity to acknowledge our mistakes and express forgiveness. I admitted to Alex how I had allowed my need for solitude and silence to overshadow his need for connection and communication. I recognized how my habit of keeping my phone on silent had contributed to his feelings of being ignored and undervalued. In turn, Alex acknowledged how his reaction to the incident, his anger, and the subsequent silent treatment had only served to exacerbate the situation, driving a wedge between us instead of fostering a constructive dialogue. Forgiveness came slowly, like the mending of a delicate fabric, stitch by stitch. We learned to forgive not just each other but ourselves for the missteps and misunderstandings that had brought us to this point. It was a process that required humility and the recognition that we were both flawed, human, and doing the best we could. As we navigated this path of reconciliation, we also began to lay the groundwork for a new way of communicating. We agreed on several ground rules to prevent similar misunderstandings in the future. The first and perhaps most important rule was that we would never leave our phones on silent when we were apart. This simple change, though small, symbolized our commitment to being accessible to each other, to prioritizing our connection over the distractions of daily life. We also decided to implement a no-screens policy during meals, dedicating that time solely to each other. This helped us create a space where we could connect without interruptions, sharing stories, thoughts, and laughter without the constant buzzing of notifications. Another strategy we adopted was the use of a communication jar. Whenever we felt frustrated or misunderstood but weren't ready to talk about it, we would write down our feelings and drop the note into the jar. This allowed us to acknowledge our emotions without forcing an immediate conversation, giving us both time to reflect and approach the issue with a cooler head. Perhaps the most significant change, however, was our commitment to practicing active listening. 
We made a conscious effort to listen to each other without formulating a response in our minds, to truly hear what the other was saying, and to empathize with their perspective. This shift in our approach to communication transformed our conversations, making them more meaningful and less prone to misunderstandings. As we implemented these new strategies and habits, our relationship began to flourish in ways we hadn't anticipated. We discovered new depths to our connection, finding joy in the simple act of sharing our day or discussing our dreams for the future. The challenges we had faced became a catalyst for growth, pushing us to strengthen our bond and deepen our understanding of each other. The journey from confrontation to resolution had been a long one, marked by moments of doubt, fear, and frustration. But it had also been a journey of discovery, a reminder of the power of love, communication, and forgiveness. We had emerged from it stronger, more resilient, and more committed to each other than ever before. Looking back, I realize that every relationship faces its share of trials and tribulations. What matters is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to navigate it together, to learn from it, and to emerge stronger on the other side. Our experience has taught us that with empathy, patience, and a willingness to listen, there is no obstacle too great to overcome. As we settled into this new chapter of our relationship, I felt a profound sense gratitude for the second chance we had been given. We had been given the opportunity to rebuild our relationship on a foundation of mutual respect, understanding, and love. And as we moved forward, hand in hand, I knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, we would face them together stronger and more united than ever.